In a few weeks as we get to the new year, and I'm doing, I'm working at the moment, normally what I do in the evening service is I go through an expositional series, and the Lord has laid some thoughts in my mind uh, that really kind of lean towards an evening crowd to be an encouragement to help. So for the next four weeks, we're going to do a series through the book of Jonah. Now, it's not verse by verse, all right? This is it's not topical per se. Uh, text show, I guess, is the best way to put it. What I want to do in the next four weeks is look at the God of Jonah. A lot of times we look at Jonah and we see what Jonah did and how he messed up. What I want to do tonight is I want to look at his God. Why he did some of the things he did. You know, a lot of times I look back and say, what was he doing? I think there's some neat principles and encouraging principles we can get. So the next few weeks we're going to look at the God of Jonah and how their interaction was. Um, but then we're going to start a series in January entitled Real Church. It's not necessarily topical and the ad, there'll be some topics but really what it is is how a church should work you say why an evening crowd that's great for the morning crowd now what i want to do is i want to throw some thoughts out by the way more as i've studied as i've read other books on it looked into it most of what we're going to look at we already do it's kind of natural i want to put a little bit of structure to it i don't want to overstructure i'm reading a book that's phenomenal it's called simple church how to make sure how to make the plan from salvation to full discipleship simple and i like that idea but I want us to just, you know, as we take some steps, help people get involved and really what should be and what should not be in church. Yeah, there's some things that should not be in church. All right. I give you one example. Uh, I've been told this in the past and I believe this is true. I've seen it. Sometimes we come to church. You know what we do? We've got to be perfect, right? We put on our suit. We look good. And, you know, the problems that we had all week long, we have to leave them on the kitchen table because I can't take my problems to church. I mean, come on. I'm in church. I got to look good. I mean, hello, are we not missing the point that this is where you get help? I can't tell my family about my problems and the family thinks I'm perfect. And, and, I, and now what happens is then we can get pen as hypocritical so we don't have problems. I'm not saying that the honesty means we're always in tears. But in Beatitudes, it says... Um, uh, uh, blessed is the day that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Bring to the outside what's going on, on the inside. That's just one of the things. But how do we do it? Not, it's not a crying confessional session that night, but it's how do we create that kind of atmosphere? What is biblical about some of those things? And, and uh, you say, how long is this series? I don't know. i got about seven weeks right now. Maybe a little longer. Uh, very practical. And uh, put out some series. I may even ask you some, some survey questions from our church. Ask you to fill out and give them back to me. Not personally, just about things you'd like to see. And uh, so that'll be happening in January in a few weeks. Uh, so for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the book of Jonah from a little more of a textual point of view. So tonight, Jonah chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto, the tar unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Father, I pray tonight as we just take the next 30 minutes and we look at the Word of God. Father, that we get a full understanding of who you were in this story. To look at you, Lord. It's easy for us to see Jonah. And Lord, his stubbornness, his rebellious nature, and even though you used him greatly, you kind of did it against his own wishes. And Lord, we often wonder why. So we'll get a chance to glance at that and your thinking. But Father, tonight I pray as we look at the most familiar part of the story of him about to be thrown out of a boat, Father, I pray that we would listen on purpose tonight for a new thing. Well, not just to hear a story that we've heard a thousand times, but Father, to look at principles about you. And how those principles can apply to us every day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we look at this story and we see Jonah response. And most people look at the negative responses. There's a principle in here that I've heard a lot of preachers say. And by the way, it's true. You find it interesting that from the moment Jonah decided to say no and go the other way. Do you notice the one word that was repeated over and over and over again? He went down to Joppa. He paid a fare, went down into the ship. Then he went down into the bottom of the ship, and then he went down into the ocean, and then he was at the bottom of the ocean. Some people make a really big deal. I've heard people preach entire messages on that. Um, I'm not going to preach an entire message on that, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think there is a principle tonight, and uh, we'll even mention one thing in a little bit. He paid money to get in the boat. He paid money to get away from God. 
I mean, sometimes we will do whatever we can to get away. And we could spend a lot of time talking about uh, the decisions Jonah made. And by the way, we all make very similar decisions. You know, a lot of times you look at these stories and you say, so is Jonah a bad person because of the decisions he made? Because he ran, because he fought. Was he an evil? Was he a bad person? Can I suggest to you that Jonah was human? A lot of times we pin. Did he make some bad decisions? Yes, he did. Did he end up getting used of God? Yes, it was pretty extreme, but yes, he did. And a lot of times, I think some of us find ourselves in his boat. We have plenty of reason to believe that what God wants is not good. Think about it. Jonah fully understood the evil of Nineveh. He understood how bad this place was. And so God comes to him and says, Jonah, I want to bring salvation to Nineveh. Imagine Jonah saying, are you kidding me? I mean, come on, after what you did to Sodom and Gomorrah, what are you doing? They're worse. I mean, I'm sure he figured that. Maybe debating with God. What are you thinking? Why them? There's a lot of good people that you could help. Why them? And for whatever reason, Jonah had so much animus against Nineveh. That the God, because he was a prophet, the God he served, he said, God, I get your point, but I'm not part of this. I'm not doing this. And he went the other way. I often wonder if Jonah would have said, you know, there's other guys you can send to Nineveh. Why me? I mean, come on, send me to a better place. Send someone else to Nineveh. I don't know. I'm, I'm reading a little bit into it. But I understand that for whatever reason, he really did not go. I've heard people say, Jonah just didn't want to follow God. I don't believe that. I believe Jonah just didn't want to go to Nineveh. I wonder if God had sent him somewhere else. He'd already been used of God. There was just something about Nineveh. And I've read some commentaries. I can give you five or six theories. None of them are guaranteed or proven. Here's my point. Whatever region Jonah had to run from Nineveh, he had convinced themselves there were good enough reasons to go against God. In our lives, when we know things that we think God doesn't understand, we can convince ourselves that the reason we're angry, the reason we're going this direction, the reason we don't like this is valid. And we can convince ourselves and even go this far to say, I can go this way, but God's a loving, forgiving God. We're grace, we're sin abound, grace abounds even more. So I'll be fine. And we can do that. Unfortunately, we don't usually anticipate finding ourselves in a fish's belly, right? Now, we won't find ourselves in a fish's belly, but I think we can be in stinky places just as bad if we're not careful. So let's look at God's, the God of no, um, Jonah from this idea, really that tonight we're going to look at the fact that God is never surprised, which we understand that, but he's always a few steps ahead of us. The first principle we'll see tonight is that God's will does not always seem easy. God's will does not always seem easy. We read the first four verses, and this is where God comes to Jonah. We mentioned this this morning, that when we look at God's will, it doesn't always make sense. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed in your own life that when God asks us to take steps of faith, they don't make sense and they're not easy. You notice that? All right. I want you to go tell somebody you've never met about me. Outside of people who just love talking in crowds, does that sound normal and natural? Mostly not. You know, most of us, we cower in. We get our whatever we're doing. We're leaving. We disappear. I, I catch myself when I go to Giant. I look for to get in, get out, use the self-checkout, Right? That way you don't have to be annoyed by the person who can't count money, all right? I do it all myself. It's easy to do. And when God says, step out of your comfort zone, but Lord, it's uncomfortable. And we do that. Hence the reason, faith. When God asks us to step out in faith and giving or whatever else it would be, it's not easy. It doesn't make sense. And by the way, humanly speaking, we would do it differently in most things, wouldn't we? Okay, I'll give you one example. If I were looking for someone to work in the ministry, I wouldn't have picked me. I'd be honest with you, I wouldn't have. I would have found somebody who a little more bold, a little less, you know, wanted to hide the corner, I guess. I would have found something different. That's because I know me. I know my natural tendencies. I know the part of me that wants to just kind of disappear and do my own thing. That's me. I have to fight that every day. When God asks us to step out in faith, overcoming a sin or taking the step of faith, it doesn't always seem easy. And we think, well, as soon as God's will is easy, I follow it. God's will is rarely easy. Understand that. Now, God's will will always have strength to do it, but it's rarely easy. Brother Nobley and I went Tuesday night at McDonald's, and we were going with the purpose of hoping to witness to somebody. So I'm standing at the register, and there was a brand new guy at the register. How do I know that? He told us it was his first day. He was brand new. And I asked him for a certain coffee, 
And he sat there, and I, I don't think he ever seen coffee before in his life. Poor guy. She was, push this, push this. No, 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 not that one. And he's sitting there, and he, is, he looks so frightened. I was convinced that he thought if he pushed the wrong button, he'd blow McDonald's up. I mean, he just, that register scared him. So I handed him a card inviting him to church, and, uh, and he looked right at me, and I was so convinced of him to say, I don't need that. I don't want it. Leave me alone. You know what I got from him? Thank you. I am really interested about this. Where is your church? And, I, and you know what I'm doing at this point? I'm slowly walking away waiting for him to tell me I'm not interested. And I had like, stop. Oh, oh, okay, let me tell you about him. And will he show up? I don't know, but the point is I didn't get yelled at by him. You know, I'm standing here saying I want my coffee to go sit in my corner, right? So there was another couple. And what was the purpose? We were there looking for family. And so I'm sitting there in this couple, and I'm glancing. There's one family. They're a little later, and there's one family there. And as they're getting ready to leave, the Lord slapped me upside the head, give him a card, invite him to church. And I began to have exactly what you've done, the battle with the creator of the universe. No, he doesn't look happy. You know what? I mean, he, he, he's going to throw his coffee on me. He didn't even have coffee, but that was my debate, all right? He's going to throw my coffee on me, all right? No, I don't want to do it. What's going to happen? You know, what if, they, what if the McDonald's management kicks me out? I mean, I'm having this debate as we are talking. I, you know, a lot of things going on in my mind. I'm having this debate. Finally, as they stood up, the Lord goes, now, nah, fine. So I, I literally, <laughs> I pull out the card, I jump down, I walk over, and I said, do you mind? I don't want to interrupt, but I just love to invite you in waiting for them to turn around and say, get away. You know, that's what I was waiting for. Thank you. She grabs, shakes, they both shake my hand, and they were very pleasant. And I sat back down, and I sat down. Whew, my heart's going, doo -doo 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 -doo, right? You've been there. If you haven't been, you're lying, all right? We're all, you know, it's amazing. We do. We think I should do something, and God tells us to do it. But, like, but Lord, there's so many other better ways to do it. Here, here's a better way, all right? If I want to go sewing, here's a better way. The skit guys talk about this, and I think it's hilarious. I want to be a better sewing winner. I won't tell anybody. I'll just get a right shirt, right? You know, you, you know just hit 10, Romans 10, 13 on the, on the shirt and just sit there, and I'll be a billboard for Jesus. I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to be a billboard for Jesus, right? We can find a thousand ways. And God says, no, it doesn't make sense. God's will will not always make sense. And when God brings things into your life, sometimes they won't make sense. We see, number one, God's plea. He tells Jonah, go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to do it. So what do we see, number two, jo Jonah's flight. I want you to notice a couple of things that I am going to take because there's a, kind of the argument here. Verse four, the first, I'm sorry, verse three. What does it say? But... Jonah rose. He heard his command. My biggest thing is this, but Jonah. Jonah had his own plan. He was going to do his own thing. And he you know what he's thinking in his mind? I think this, my opinion. I'm thinking, you know what? God wants me to go, and I want Nineveh to fall down. So if I go the opposite direction, then God has no option but to punish Nineveh. I wonder that. And so he gets down. He goes the opposite way. He's got a plan. He's going to make God do what he wants, and he goes the other direction. He flew from God. He went down, as we talked about. And then, as we said, actually cost him money. He paid money to disobey God. Let me tell you something I think and honestly say in this point. When you are doing what you can to go and fight against God, it will cost you not only money, but time and friends and family, health and all the different things. It will cost you. You're fighting that battle with God. You're going away. And God is not asking you to do something horrible. God's not asking you to go it alone. He's saying, go with me to do this. Go in my place and I will be there with you. Do this step and I will help you through it. He's asking for those things. And when we decide to say, I don't want to, I don't want to, we're asking, we're fighting the creator of the universe. But then I love this. What does it say in verse 4? The first three words, but the Lord. He said, I don't want to do it. And the Lord said, okay, that's fine. I got plan B, and it's still you. I'm still going to fix it. Vance Havner used to say this. He was in Romans, you know, in Romans it says, but God commendeth his love toward us. And Vance Havner used to say, I love it when God butts in. I tell you what, I love it when he butts in in salvation. When, I, when our lives were going the wrong way, and he kind of butts himself in, and we see salvation. I love it when he does it in my rebellion. Lord, I want to do things my way. I'm comfortable here. I like this here. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be old-fashioned or weird or super spiritual, whatever. I like this. And God says, no, I want you to do this. And even in my rebellion, God is not beating me. God is not on my cage. You know what he's doing? He is just pleading with me to come back. Now, if I go far enough, God will do something extravagant to get my attention. We'll see in a little bit. 
But even in my rebellion, in my discouragement, God butts in. When I'm really hurting, God will allow something to happen to help to bring encouragement. Sometimes it's just Him. My wife sang a song a couple weeks ago. Uh, I love this song. The Bible talks about you may know all the biblical answers, but the chorus says, when answers aren't enough, there's Jesus. I have all the biblical answers sometimes for the battles that we face, but that doesn't mean that those answers are enough to deal with the battle. You know what I need at that point? Just God. Just that strength. Just that help. And that's what He wants, even in my time of discouragement. He butts in in my time of need. When I am hurting and all alone and I need something, He is there to interject. And so God says, you've got your own plan. i got something better. And you know, the problem is I like control. You ever seen that commercial? Some people call me a control freak. I prefer the word control enthusiast, you know? I resemble that remark. All right, I understand that. You know, we go through different places and you want everything to be a certain way. And uh, I love it. I've not seen, I can say this, I've not seen this in this church, but every once in a while when uh, you have ladies set up decorations, if you move them an inch, they'll come and adjust them. You know, like during the prayer. You have an opening prayer and you have three women fighting over where they're going to put, you know, move it there, move it there. I noticed that this had been moved. So when I started, you know how I noticed this had been moved? I almost tripped over the hymnals it was on, all right? I was like, what was that? And I realized the hymnal. So I fixed it, waiting for someone to mention to me, I noticed you moved the, the pot there. You know, some people, they just got to be, and everybody's looking at it, all right? So this one right here, okay? So you're trying to figure out what I'm talking about. You got to be in control. You go down to the welcome center, the TV's too loud. The TV's not loud enough. How come I can't see him? He does not talk. I, um, I don't like it. You know, it's easy. We come in and we want that. Same with God. We want things our way. By the way, why? Because we are convinced this way's better. And God says, you know, I may even get to the same ending, but I got a different way to get there. Why does God have a different way to get there? Because it lifts him up. It's easy for us to fight that. So the second thing that we're going to look at tonight is that when we fight God, it, will all, it, hurts. it always hurts others. When we fight God, it will always hurt others. Verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto God to cast forth the wares that were in the ship to lighten it of them. But, the, uh, but Jonah was gone down to the side of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Rise and call upon thy God, if so be that thou wilt think upon us that we, may, we perish not. And they said, every one of them, his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause is evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they said unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for what cause, for whose cause is evil is upon us? What is thine occup occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid. I do find it interesting that when he explained the God, they'd been praying to gods. When he said who he feared, they were afraid. And said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then say they unto him, What shall we do unto thee? That the sea may be calm unto us. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake is this great tempest upon you. Nevertheless, the men roared hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this land's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done it as it pleased thee. And they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. The first thing we see is a powerful storm simply put when we fight the lord it will always feel like a storm when i'm fighting god it will always be a little uncalm nothing will be easy nothing is peaceful there'll be fighting in the home fighting in the marriage fighting and i'm not even talking about battles of marriage i'm talking my own personal walk with god god has something he's asking me to do sometimes it'll be a sin that i don't want to get rid of Sometimes it'll be at a step of faith that God wants me to be involved in. Either way, I don't know, oh Lord, I'm fighting. I don't know if I want to do it. I'm nervous about it. And so it'll always feel like a storm. It's just raging. I don't ever have peace. I go to bed and I can't seem to overcome it. I wake up, enough coffee is just not going to solve the problem. I read the Bible, but as I read it, I know what God wants. And oh, man, it's just, it just, I can't find peace. You know why? Because when, I, when God wants something and He really wants to work, you know what He wants? He, he will give peace once I say yes to Him. 
As long as I say I want my own way, it will never be peaceful. It will always be a problem, and we'll find ourselves in the middle of a powerful storm. So here's the question. Why then, when Jonah said no? Because we believe that God gives Jonah a free will, gives every man a free will. But yet when he went out, God threw a storm out there. So I've evaluated this story in my life many, many times, wondering, Lord, he said no. Why the storm? You know, one of the things I think is so important to realize is when God has the perfect will, it's better. He's not just going to let us run off into the street and play in the, with the cars. You understand that? Let's give an example of a father-son relationship. If our sons decide that we're going to come home and they want to do something stupid, something dangerous, and we walk out and we see it, we give them free will. You know, if they want to climb up three stories and jump off and see if they can hit the one-foot trampoline, they can try it. You know, it sounds cool. I was saying I were watching a commercial last night, or something last night, and a guy was doing a backflip off the roof into his pool. The pool is quite a ways away from the roof, and they got captions of what they're saying. The guy up there, what, what could happen? The caption says, you could die. And I'm watching this, and I, you know, I'm watching, they were, you know, as he's getting ready to jump, I'm like this. You know, because you don't know what they're going to show. I'm figuring he made it since they showed it on TV. And he jumps and it goes to commercial. And Nathan and I are like, oh, man, now we got to wait. So he comes back and he makes it. I mean, by inches, skims his face going in. And I'm sitting there. He was fine. I was hurting. From, don't miss. You know, I'm hurting watching it. If we saw that, as a father, we would say, well, you know, he's probably going to miss. And I'm going to take him to the hospital and he'll have one less leg. But he's got a free will. And I want him to discover this by himself. Go ahead and jump. Let me get my camera. No, we wouldn't. We'd walk up in all the great love we can muster. And we'd slap him upside the head and say, get off the roof. Because we know what's better for those people that young. There are times where God knows what is good so much. He will push to get us to go there. Because he knows the end is not only good for his cause, but for us. And he loves you enough to bring you to that point. There's not only a powerful storm, but then there's a great fear. These mariners were frightened even though they had faced storms before. Mariners were sailors. They'd done this for a living. The Bible says they were wares. They tossed the wares off. Those were things. People had paid them to transport items from one side to the other. And so when they were throwing these things over, they were losing money. So these people who knew what they were doing, they were very professional at this, realized the ship's going down, and they're chucking over money because they don't want to die. That's how bad the storm was. And they try, they go cast lots, and they're trying to figure it out. And it comes down to Jonah, and they're like, what's this guy? Now, I would have thought it's kind of strange that I'm bailing out water, and this dude's in the bottom of the slip, uh, ship sleeping. You know why? He's down there. And this is how I wonder. There's two different points of view of what Jonah thought down there. Either one, I'd rather die than follow him. I don't know. Or number two, as long as God has a plan for me, I'm not going to die. I don't know what his plan was, but he stayed down there and seemed to be peacefully. He was going to do whatever he wanted. While this storm, the storm was causing great tragedy to the people up on the ship. Sometimes we don't notice that when we want our way, and again, it's not always rebellion. It's just this battle of right, what, we, what his way or my way. And should I follow? Maybe it's a sin. I, I, something like that. And we fight. You know what happens? My fight causes grief and it affects other people. I can never be in a battle against God and only affect me. It will affect my marriage. It will affect my home. It will affect people around me. It will affect my workplace. It will affect other people. When I make bad decisions, it will affect them. And so this affected all the people in there. We also hurt the lost. They're those who, want, who are watching us. They, we hurt that. They see our actions. They see maybe our apathy. They don't see our Savior working in our lives. And so therefore they sit back and say, I thought He claimed to be saved. He's no different than others. Sometimes God is looking just for a distinction because He says, I want to be able to show something to you. I want to use you and that it comes down to surrender. We mentioned this a few weeks ago in our message on worship. It comes down to surrender. Lord, this is your plan. I want to follow you. Let me, as before we get to our third point, let me ask you a thought. Why did God create mankind? A couple of reasons. One, fellowship. All right? Two, to glorify him. So he will get glory from your life. In some situations, I've seen him get glory from people's death. Because he will get glory. That is why we were created. And he will get it. You know what? I'd rather give it to him. 
than have it to be taken. I'd rather it be something I do by choice. And that is something He wants from us. The third thing we see Jonah does is extreme response. Jonah told them to kill him. Catch this. He says, what do I got to do for the water to stop? He goes, kill me. Throw me into the sea. Just throw me in there. These guys are thinking, man, you worship Almighty Jehovah God. If we throw you in there, we're a punishment. We're going to be punished for killing you. He says, nope, just throw me in there. And they tried to work. They tried to do other things. And Jonah goes, nope, just throw me in there. Why? Jonah was aware that God was in action. When God's working in our lives, sometimes just to encourage and help, we are aware of it. We can fight it. We can say, I don't believe it. But it is obvious to those who are in those situations. So let's look at the last thing here. God is always prepared to bring us back. Look at verse number 17. I like this. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. The Lord was prepared. You know what that means? The Lord came to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh. You know what God knew? God knew that Jonah was going to say no. God knew that Jonah was going to go down to Joppa. God knew that Jonah was going to pay money to get into the ship and to go to Tarshish. God knew that. I wonder how long he had prepared it, but I have a tendency to believe, my personal opinion, that when he came to him and said, go to Nineveh, he had already prepared the fish. Because he knew what Jonah's response was going to be. And maybe a day earlier, he had prepared the fish to be in the right area. He goes, because I'm going to talk to my servant, and I'm going to need you to give him a ride back to shore. It was already prepared. You know what that means? God is so sovereign. That when he comes and he asks me, he knows my answer, right or wrong. He has a preparation for that. Sometimes ways to prod me to go back. Sometimes way to encourage me to go right. Sometimes he's got that blessing waiting there. He is prepared. He knows my answer. I am so glad that I serve a God that's not surprised by my answers. I am glad that when he comes to me, he is already prepared for whatever I'm going to do. I can never get over the idea that God prepared this fish ahead of time. That God is always ready to help, to heal, and even to strengthen. When I'm sinning, He's there to bring reconciliation. When I'm hurting, He's there to bring healing. When I am in need of power, He is there to offer that. A couple things. One, we see God is watching. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Proverbs 15, verse 3. The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil, and the good. Now, most of us, when we look at that verse, or at least initially, and I've heard people preach this, they spend 40 minutes on the evil of the verse and five minutes on the good. All right? We know that God sees our sin. That doesn't surprise anybody. But I think that God sees three things in this verse one, he sees our sin. Two, he sees our service. Three, he sees our sorrow. God is watching. When we look at the fact that God is prepared, that means God is watching with great anticipation to see what is going to happen in our lives. He's looking forward to great things, knowing what's going to happen, but looking to see how He can move us, and He's watching. He uh, he sees the sin, and we know that, but then when we serve, how many times, don't raise your hand, okay, how many times have we served God and wondered if anybody noticed? None that? Lord, I handed out a thousand tracts this week and no one noticed. And the preacher did not come to me and say, good job for handing out a thousand tracts this week. Now, just because they were all in the bathrooms at the mall, okay? It doesn't mean anything, all right? I bought a thousand tracts this week. Just because 500 of them went to one person doesn't mean anything, all right? No, I'm, I'm joking, but, you know, we do that. I cleaned up a toilet. No one noticed it today. I fixed this and no one notices. Let me tell you, in all honesty, just an encouragement. When you think that no one sees what you've done for him, God sees it it is so easy for us to sit back and say lord i'm dying and i don't see fruit and sometimes you will be involved in ministry and you will not see fruit right away you know what god says i am watching i see it and i promise you i will not be your debtor and i will bring blessing just keep going he sees our sin and he sees our service I like what, and then it says, and then it says, we seize our sorrow. I like what it says in Galatians 6 9. Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap. What does it say? If we faint not. When you're tired, when you're ready to quit, and by the way, 
usually it's freezing cold out there. So it's usually to say right now we're cold and tired, right? Right now, you all want to go out swimming. I mean, it's just beautiful out there. My car said 72 degrees today. I, wanted, I should have. I want to take a picture of that posting on Facebook and say, you know, take that, people in Florida. All right? This is beautiful weather. Absolutely. Now, granted, in a month from now, when it's minus five, I'm going to get all those back to me. That's why I didn't do it. But Jim would tell you, we get these times we're tired. I, one of the things, and I try, you know, it can be easily depressing if you're not careful. When we leave here, I leave here usually around 4 30, 5 o'clock, 5 30, depending on what I'm doing. You walk out at, four, at 3 o'clock. You know what happens? The sun is setting, it feels like, doesn't it? I'm convinced by the time Christmas hits, the sun's going to set at 12 55 p.m. I'm convinced of it. It's just dark so early. So last night, my son and I were out shopping. I get back in the car, and I did. I felt like I was 92, I'll be honest with you. I got in the car, like, oh, I'm so tired. i got to go home and go to bed. I looked, it was 5.15. I felt like an old man. I was like, you got to be kidding me, 5.15, what? It's so dark out here without any lights. Man, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't see a thing. And my son, of course, he had just woken up for a nap, so he was ready to go. Let's go, Dad. And I'm like, what, 5.15? Man, I thought for sure it had to be 3 in the morning. You know, it gets tiring. When you're serving, and you're serving, and sometimes only two or three people show up to minister to. You know what? Minister to them. Because God sees that. When you're tired, keep going. This afternoon, the choir walked in, just like me. You know, dragon. Everybody's sitting here. Okay, I'm here. I gotta be. They're ministering. Keep going. Because God says, in due season, you'll reap. If you don't quit, keep going. Because God sees your service, and then God sees your sorrow. You wonder sometimes, does God really see what I'm going through? God is aware of all of it. And He is there to be a help. We need to go to Him and let Him do it. We need to go and ask Him about it. We need to go and talk to Him about it. It's okay to talk to other people. It's okay to ask for prayer. Don't let the preacher and the deacons and teachers be the, diff, the, uh, the absence of God in that time of prayer. Go to Him. Let Him be that strength that we need. He knows our sorrow. We see, first of all, that God is watching. We see, second of all, that God is waiting. I love when we think about the story of the prodigal son. The father, who is a representation of God in this story, was waiting in the front of the house for a son to come home. He didn't chase him down to the other land. He didn't go out and say, come home. He sat there waiting. When he came home, he didn't sit there and say, how dare you do that to my name? He went running to him. That is the God that we serve. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Psalm 103, verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 145, 8, The Lord is gracious a full of, and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. You know, when I decide whether to sin or whether not to follow, you know what God's doing? He is just waiting. For me, just to turn around and say, all right, Lord, let's do this. He is waiting. He's not going to force me back in. He's not going to kick. He may bring storms. He may bring scenarios. But he is just waiting for me to make that decision. Aren't you glad that you serve a merciful Savior? I am so grateful that maybe the third time that day I have fallen to the same sin, that sin and easily besets me. And I get on my knees and I say, Lord, I know you think I'm joking, but this is the third time today. And I ask you, not audibly, by the way, but you know what I know God's saying? It's already been taken care of. I forgive you. I am so grateful that that is the God I serve. And then lastly, we see God is willing. God is not waiting for us to be perfect. He's waiting for us to be willing. Be willing, number one, to admit and confess fault. Be willing to try. Be willing to follow. You know, when you think about this idea that they wanted to toss Jonah, he had to go into the water and end up being swallowed by a fish. I don't think they thought, let's see here. Hey, there's a fish. Let's toss him out to him, all right? You know, I, that's not what was going on. And I've been asked, why would God be so drastic as Jonah happened to be thrown into the water? Can I give you what I believe is a great application from that part of the story right there? When God is trying to get our attention, He wants us to turn back. He doesn't want a simple, okay, no big deal. He wants us to seriously acknowledge that sin is what it is. 
I think the biggest battle we have today and why we don't have the victory that, one of some, that we could is because we know what the Bible says, but we won't acknowledge it in our mind. We know it's sin, but ah, no big deal. God wants us to see sin as He sees sin. Filthy, horrible, something that grieves the Holy Spirit. God wants us to see His will as something wonderful and pleasant and great. And by the way, something we should desire to do. That's what God wants us to see. That's what God wants to do in our life. And He wants us to be willing to step out and do it. And yes, yeah, sometimes it's going to take some sacrifice. Sometimes it's going to take something extreme. And you know what? Is it okay to sacrifice and be a bit extreme for our Savior? I hope it is. I hope it's okay to be a little tired in serving God. I hope it's okay to sacrifice and to serve when it doesn't seem anybody notices. I hope in your mind it's okay to say, I'll take the extra step because God's watching and that is the God I serve. And when I sacrifice to Him, He will take care of all the other great blessings. You know, we look at Jonah now in the water. We'll talk next week about this debate. Three-day debate between Jonah. Not next week, two weeks from now. This big debate between Jonah and God. God sometimes wants us to be serious. When we get rid of a sin, by the way, if you get rid of a sin, and maybe it's a physical thing, if you don't actually get rid of it, it'll come back to haunt you. Let me give you an example. Okay, an alcoholic struggling with alcohol. They got the four bottles of wine or beer or whatever they're using. You know, oh, man, I don't want to drink this stuff, and it's horrible. You know what I'll do? I'll shove it in the back of the cupboard so it'll be there. I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to throw it away. It's horrible. I'll shove it in the back of the cupboard behind everything out. That way, I won't see it. And then guess what happens when you're really, really struggling? I remember in the back of that cupboard. Say, but I put a lot of money into it. That's fine. Get rid of it. Well, that could be anything in our life. Anything. As long as that thing we know is tempting is still there, it will be a temptation. And God sometimes wants us to make a drastic move to be in place with Him. Some of the steps we take in faith are drastic. Let me encourage you. As you think about your walk with God, that God is asking us sometimes to take some big steps of faith. Most of you in this room have taken a lot of them and have seen God bless. We look down and see God work. Many in this room are involved in ministry and been able to see some pretty neat things. Some have been involved in ministry and say, well, I'm looking forward to the greater fruit. We just keep at it. Because God's got something better even down the road. We just got to be faithful. Let me remind you, He was prepared for Jonah to enter that water. He's prepared to bless you. He's prepared to do what's necessary to get you where He can give you the greatest blessing and use you. You can choose to say, Lord, I want to be there myself, or you can allow storms to bring you there. Let me encourage you not to be like Jonah, but just to come ahead of time and say, Lord, I may not like everything I'm at being at. It may not be comfortable. It may not be my favorite thing, but I will do it if you ask me to do it. Father, we love you. We thank you for the time you've given us tonight privilege we've had, Lord, to be able to study Your Word. And I look, Lord, as a really quick survey of chapter 1 of Jonah. And Lord, how he made some very specific decisions. But Father, I look at an Almighty God who was prepared. Prepared way ahead of time. I believe before you even asked Jonah to move, you were prepared. Father, I'm grateful that You are prepared for me. Prepared when I mess up. Prepared when I say yes. You are watching. You are seeing, yes, my sin. You're seeing the service. And Lord, you're also seeing that sorrow. Father, I pray that we would hold on to those things. I pray we'd never give up. And I pray that we would fight. And we would keep staying strong, even though sometimes it does not seem easy. Father, may we willingly say, Lord, this is yours. Use it for your honor and glory. I pray you'd work in this invitation time with your head bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around. Just a second. We're going to sing nearer, still nearer. We're going to sing it all together here in just a second. I think it's a great verse, a song to think about in this premise of coming and just wanting to be closer to the Lord. But let me ask you, first of all, this question tonight. The most important question about being able to see God work, number one, is do you know Him as your Savior? If you die today, are you 100% sure that heaven is your home? You say, Pastor, I don't know that honestly, that I'd like to know more about it. If that's you, would you do me a favor and raise your hand and say, Preacher, I don't know. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me tonight? Anybody like that this evening? I'm not sure. Pray for me tonight. Here's the second question. Are we 
in a battle with God right now, where we have that kind of a battle of wills, whether to get away from bad or whether it's to do good. And God is asking us to step out. Man, we're uncomfortable. And God is asking us to do it. Maybe tonight we need to say, Lord, it's your will. I'm going to follow it. It's not going to be easy. It's not necessarily my uh, comfort zone, but Lord, I will step out and do it. Maybe God is speaking in your heart tonight about a specific thing or just in general. Maybe there is a sin you've got to get rid of and you say, Lord, I need strength to personally get rid of this. Whatever it be in just a second, as we sing together, near or still near, I would encourage you to turn this platform an old-fashioned altar in just a little bit. You do business with God. Lord, as we sing here in just a moment, I pray that we would listen to your word. I prayed we'd follow as you'd have us to, Lord. Lord, I pray our greatest desire would be closer to you. Father, not trying to find the least we can do, not trying to find those little battles, oh Lord, but just to be fully devoted to you. Father, as we sing this in a moment, I pray that would also be a song of testimony, a song of surrender. Lord, if we need to spend some time on our knees, I pray as we sing in a moment, we'd be willing to do that. Lord, I pray you bless as we, as we come to this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together with me, please?